Bill Mogridge, who was the uh, co-founder of IDEO, and he was the director of the National Museum of Design here in the United States. He had this diagram of design thinking, and it had like all these like phases, and it had these lines that connected all of them. And he said, this is what we sell design thinking as. Then he had a next picture of, there's all these arrows in every direction of every kind of thing. This is how it actually occurs. So I kind of think that mystery implies non-linearity. You're not sure what path it will take. If you aren't open or comfortable with that, you really can't design think. All you can do is process think because designing is about the divergence coming back to convergence. It takes you away from safety and brings you back to execution. I think by being in Silicon Valley and seeing how design was becoming capitalizable, I wasn't sure what kind of design it meant. So in the last Design and Tech Report, we talked about how there's three kinds of design. There's classical design, there is design thinking, and there's computational design. Classical design is like design of this table, or design is glasses. It's design that's been practiced for decades. Beautiful design, classical design, collected by museums. Design thinking is design applied to organizations, to strategy, things like our friends at IBM. How do I solve big problems with design thinking? How do I ideate together with a large team? Computational design is different. It's all design involving some manner of computation, whether that's software or hardware. It augments our senses. It connects millions of people. It involves data. It's a kind of design that's practiced in Silicon Valley a lot and now all over the world. But it's a different kind of design from designing a table or designing your organization. It's special. But again, since the 90s, it was our topic. Designers who could code, coders who could design. It's not happening at scale. And I've been a big fan of you for a long time. And uh, I know that your views in education are probably the ones that can maybe make all of academia change. Because you're uh, such a multifaceted person. And I, and I really felt that when I found this video of you on the web. Um, could you uh, uh, maybe uh, play <laughs> the video that I found on the web? Thanks. What are you doing? I'm um, digging up bamboo shoots in my yard. Now I'm going to hang So the next thing we do is we have to stew the uh, akinoko bamboo shoots and get the aku, which is this kind of funny bitter taste. So uh, that's pretty cool. And who did the music for that? Ryuichi Sakamoto. Ryuichi Sakamoto. So like, how did you get Ryuichi Sakamoto to make a soundtrack to a bamboo hunting scene? Well, we're actually old friends, so that helped. But actually, I think he liked the idea that it was for bamboo hunting and cooking, cooking scene. And cooking. Yeah. Did and you shoes. call him up to compose that, or how did that happen? I emailed him and said, hey, I'm going to do a video, and it's going to be kind of in this cool bamboo thing, and, and he likes trees. She likes trees. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Is that your backyard? Was that? That's my backyard. Yeah. This is and this is pre Fukushima. Oh wow. So we don't do this anymore. Oh, so okay. we have, we have now a very not a very thing. We we have a, a measurable amount of cesium now in that in that that forest. So we, we don't do that anymore. Uh, and I remember when Fukushima happened, you launched a whole thing to do radiation detectors, something like that. Yeah. So, so I was actually at the media lab interviewing for the job, and what we did was we and I needed to find out what the radiation was and try to get it up, get the word out. So we, I'll do this. The short version is that we, we ended up starting a nonprofit um, to build Geiger counters, put them on cars, run around and measure them. And we have, I think, about 15 million measurements. At the beginning, the government hated us, but now we're the main source of open radiation measurements in the world. And everybody's trying to figure out how we did it because we started after the earthquake, but we our response has been, we, we have a better organized network. In each country, I'm sure you have this thing called the parent teacher conference. Do you know about the parent teacher conference? Not the ones for your kids, but the one you had as a child where your parents come to school and your teacher talks to your parents and it's a little bit awkward. Well, I remember in third grade, I had this moment where my, my father, who never takes off from work, he's a classical blue collar, a working class immigrant person going to school to see his son, how he's doing. And the teacher said to him, he said, you know, John is good at math and art and he kind of nodded. The next day I saw him talking to a customer at our tofu store and he said, you know, John's good at math. And that always stuck with me all my life. Why did dad say art? Why was it not okay? Why? Uh, became a question in my entire life. And um, that's all right because uh, being good at math meant he bought me a computer. And um, some of you remember the, this computer, this is my first computer who had an Apple II. 
Apple II users, very cool. I just remember the Apple II did nothing at all. You'd plug it in, you'd type it, a green text would come out, it would say you're wrong most of the time. That was a computer we knew. That computer is a computer that I learned about uh, going to MIT, my father's dream. And MIT, however, I learned about the computer at all levels. Than any NGO or government, and we're pivoting now to uh, air quality. But, but, but it was a really interesting experiment because we just used the internet to collect all these people, including people like Ray Ozzie and others who, you know, all the people who happened to have time who knew exactly what we needed. But it was a, a very much a pull, um, pull the resources from your network as you need them and sort of to get to that metaphor about stocking knowledge in your brain. We, I didn't know anything, but within a month we knew more than anybody in the government did. And and now, several years later, I think we have the largest movement. But it all started because I saw this cloud of radiation headed towards my house. And I thought about this bamboo. And could we eat? We wanted to measure things. And so did a lot of other people. But we activated this movement. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a real product of the internet. And, and I wouldn't call it rebel. It wasn't rebellion, but it was completely anti-establishment because we knew they would fail because they, so, they were too prepared for the wrong thing. It made me think about how you know, your presentation sort of talked about the, the fallacy of institutions. And yet, uh, I think it was Jean Monnet said that we need institutions because they, they make things last. And so I love how you made an institution to solve the problem. And that's a lot from, I think, your background in venture capital, in that you believe that money can create something mm. of good or of bad, et cetera. So none of that. But uh, we're in an institution, Pop Tech, and we're, gonna, uh, we're in this state called uh, Maine. And you know, I, I, I asked uh, the president of Pop Tech, uh, Lisa Filderman, if she could help find the bamboo shoot equivalent in Maine. It's kind of hard because you're always thinking about like what to do today, like not like what to do in years from now. I've always wondered what futurists do. My boss, Nicholas Negroponte, my former boss, Nicholas Negroponte, was uh, always able to think in the future. He had, uh, what's it called, rose-colored glasses on. And so I always thought it was bizarre. Maybe because I come from uh, no wealth. I grew up uh, with parents who had no education. Great parents, mind you, but it was always like, you know, how to survive. So I think in my older years, I'm thinking like, huh, well, let's think in the future more often. What can I learn from that period? How do I be less nowist and how to be more futurist? Well, I've been reading as much as I can about the future, even though that's kind of like uh, contradictory because when you write a book, it like takes like a couple of years to get out, so it's already like too late. But I really enjoyed the work of Brett King. I've been like carrying this book around, it's kind of heavy. I'm not a Kindle person, so I guess I'm not too futuristic but I really enjoy how he frames things as, so having that ability to kind of undo things enables you to innovate. If you don't have that room, you can't innovate. So making that room is the art of actually jumping into the future. So it really is about being able to operate in the now, be able to figure out what, what has to get done now, and then make space and then look to the future, figure out what that could be, and connecting the two together like a Reese's peanut butter cup, chocolate and the peanut butter, together. And if you can do that, so it's not too far in the future, too wimpy, kind of in the present, that jump can happen and a big uh, Star Wars Ewok celebration ending happens.